Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. I'm your host, Daniel Maynard, and today my, my special guest and I, Mark, shall talk about the emperors Heraclius and Constance II and how they dealt with the Eastern menace. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Mark. I'm a... Uh, I guess we can. I guess I am your friend, aren't I? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've. I am. Um, I'm quite. Quite the. Quite. You know. I. Quite interested in Byzantine history. I think. I say quite interested. That that is not an understatement in any way. Um, and yes, I'm. You know, those of you who. Uh, who follow the channel may see some of my comments here and there, usually saying oh, I disagree. But um, <laughs> well, if everyone agreed, then life would be very boring. <laughs> yes, but it'd be very easy. So, <laughs> well, anyway, I understand you are a big fan of Heraclius, Mark. Yes, I am a huge fan of Heraclius. Indeed, he is my favourite of all the Roman emperors. Would you like to tell us a bit about him and why you think he is such a great emperor? Uh, well, I mean, my my um, my criteria for judging how great an emperor is, um, unfortunately, due to my own injury, or fortunately or unfortunately, is I I do approve of military successes, um, and I think that Heraclius does a military success when Rome needs the military success. Uh, mm. Obviously, he came came to the throne and overthrew Focus, who in turn had overthrown Morris in uh, 602, I believe. Yes. And then Heraclius overthrows Focus in 610. But throughout all of this period, you've got to remember the Sassanid Persians were uh, overrunning the east. And doing and overrunning it quite well, um, and so and by you know for a series of military disasters, after you know some sort of stabilisation in Constantinople itself, um, Heraclius then has to take command of the the last army and march out east to well win or lose the empire really, and. If he'd failed, then I think history would have been very, very different. Um, and yeah, that's that is basically why I think he is brilliant. Um, future, you know, and yes, he obviously will get on to later. I'm sure he's the man who lives too long, but mm -hmm. um, he's you know that that shouldn't that shouldn't sully his reputation. I don't think I. <laughs> You know, it's you know, like just because, just be, I mean, as I say, I have views on the later events, which I I don't think Heraclius really could have done anything, and it was an achievement that he managed to do what he did, and yes. that the empire did survive. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it's a very he is a very much one of these. He was in the right place at the right time, and did the right things. Yes. Um. It was very close, his campaign. If to give it some context, Heraclius uh, trained an army and headed east to attack the Persian Empire, uh, the Sass Sassanid Empire. At the same time, the Sassanids and the Avars, who were their allies, as well as the Slavs, attacked Constantinople and put it under siege, so it was a very close-run thing. But it took guts to yes. leave Constantinople and not not run back to defend it. Mm. Um, I think I think that's almost the you know, is really the turning point of the war in that he isn't drawn back. He takes the fight to the Sassanids, hoping, a, ho I, hoping that the city will survive. Yes. Yeah, it must have been. Well, that brings me on to another point that when Heraclius first took the throne, he did consider 
moving the capital to Carthage. Yes. Uh, which, in all fairness to him, would have made, because that's where his own power base was. Yes. He had come from Carthage. His father, Heraclius the Elder, Elder was the exarch, the governor of the province which he had come from. So that made sense. But he decided to stay, and it seems he made the right choice in that regard. Yes. Uh, and, I mean, so at the end, I mean, the, the defences of Al Constantinople, I think they're, you know, they're, they're so formidable that, even though, yes, I do say it's a gutsy move for him to take the fight to the Sassanids, but equally... They the, and the and the and the Avars and the Sassanids did get close to taking the city, but you, it would, would have he he would have they would have had a difficult time of doing it. Yes, and you got remember the city only falls you know twice to a foreign power in the next and only once through the land walls. Yeah, yeah. So. And of course, and then you know, in 1453, um, the Ottomans have cannon against <laughs> walls which, yes. all intents and purposes, were built by uh, Theodosius. Uh, mid fifth century. Mm, yes. Yes. So there is a story about the siege of Constantinople as well, isn't there? What uh, siege? <laughs> uh, the Sassanid siege. Yeah, well, the Sassanid siege. Yeah. Would well, you like to about that? Yeah. Well, they, I mean, they do it um, more times now, but I think this is the first time they do it when they parade Mary, the icons to Mary around the um, land walls of the city. Yes. Um, and... You know, if if you are so inclined, then Mary's intervention saved the city. Um, but of course, you, even, even if even if she didn't, the you know the propaganda boost of that, and the fact that they do do it future times in history shows the impact I think of that on the Byzantine psyche. Mm. There is um, this is a topic for another time, but there is a religious aspect to this war that I don't think you really see in previous ones. Um, probably because it is the Christian Roman Empire versus the Zoroastrian Persians that mm. I mean, uh, faith in Christ is a very important aspect of their morale. So it features very prominently yes. in this war. Although I think that any sort of um, Equating, oh, sorry, um, any sort of any sort of equating um, Heraclius's campaign with the future Crusades, I think, is quite anachronistic. Mm. Um, but equally, yes, there was a, you know, it, it was, and I, in all fairness, the fate of Christendom, in you know, of Western Christendom, was at stake in this struggle. Yes. And Byzantium, I think of as a shield for a infant Christendom who needs time to grow and mature. Mm. And eventually it reaches adulthood, arguably, in the form of Charlemagne. But yeah. until that point, if Byzantium had fallen, I think history would have been very, very different. I would agree. Um, so... After Heraclius defeats the Persians at the Battle of Nineveh, I believe, is the most decisive battle. Uh, they... Although we should also make note of his... Um... Sorry for interrupting. Um, That's absolutely... his, um, his excellent defeating of the Sassanid forces in detail um, in, in the um, southern bits, parts of the Armenian mountains. Yes, in um, Armenia. Yeah. Um, yeah, because obviously that that was the crucial point. Mm. Um, I think I'm, I'm sure others 
I hope think so also. <laughs> yes. Well, Armenia is the best place to attack the Persian Empire from. Uh, I think Julian the Apostate can is a perfect example yeah. as why you shouldn't attack through Iraq. Um, for those that don't know, Julian the Apostate's army essentially was wiped out by disease and lack of supplies and the Persians themselves. And the emperor himself also. Died as well, yes. yes. But that's a topic for another time. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> yeah, so Heraclius, he defeats the Persians in the in 632, I believe? Uh, six, 22. 628 is when... 28. Oh, in 628, Heraclius defeats the Persians, and uh, they make peace. And the, he recovers the true cross. He recovers the true cross. The Persian king of kings, Khosrow II, is murdered and is replaced by Kavad II, I believe? Yes, yes. And then the Sassanid Empire falls into civil war because I believe Kavad II is ill when he comes to the throne. Yes. Um, I mean, it, the, I think the civil war sort of really gets going after he dies. Yes. Because um, there's that um, the great sort of Sassanid equivalent to the Magistar military, like their like main military general, um, Shabaraz, I think. Yes, someone. Oh, yeah. Yes, um, he um, obviously being a military strongman. Now they, I think, him and a few others all descend, all all um, ascend to the throne, um, or try to ascend to the throne. Yeah. Whereas in the Roman Empire, Heraclius demobilizes the army and tries to sort out the empire. Yes, as it were, um, and of course you got to remember that the, that he was bankrupt by this point. Yes, um, he had to ask the church to give him money, basically. Yes, um, so you know, like if if you know he doesn't need, you know, he can't be criticised for demobilizing because he isn't to know that the Arab tribes were to unify. Yes, um, and he wasn't to know that they would. <laughs> in vain. Appear, yes. I mean, it is out of the blue, really. Yes. Um, I don't think, never in the history of Arabia has something so violent occurred like no. the advent of Islam that the Romans would ever think that Arabia would be the next theatre of war. It's always been a, a it was, it was divided a place. And then they have their Gassanid buffer state, yeah, which and, usually kept things in check. Well, yes, and they'd use them in proxy wars against the Lacamids. Yes, who are the proxy state for the Sassanids. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like it's like like past them, you know, including Justinian, who some would accuse of being responsible for this whole situation. Like this is it is out of the blue. There is no way anyone can know that this sort of threat is going yes. to exist. And you know, as soon as he's you know he, he has for you know won a victory from the jaws of defeat against Rome's worst enemy. Yeah, the Sassanid uh, Empire was since the third century the biggest rival to the Roman Empire. And so I don't know. I just. He he had to do. Well, he, as if he wasn't to know, so he did he what he had him. to do to keep things going. I, I well, believe. Yes, I mean you can't. And you know, a lot of the, his soldiers, he had to. Pre, you know, he's got to get people back to the farms, back to you know. There's a whole economy he's got to try and rebuild. Also, yes, it should also be remembered that the Justinian Justinianic plague is still going on. Yes. And will continue to go on until the reign of Constantine V, I believe, in the 8th century. Yes. yes. So I believe it's calculated that 20% of the population of the entire empire died. 
So that's a fifth of the manpower gone <laughs> just there. I mean, so. I, I mean, that's part of the reason why I think towards the end of Justinian's reign, you do get a slowing down in the military successes. Mm. Very much. Also, why his successors, Justin the Second, Tiberius the Second, and Morris, basic, basically spend most of the reigns fighting because they have all of this pressure, and that um, staying still isn't an option because the empire is fragile. Although, we, you know, the, the the wars with Persia are quite ill-advised, really, at this point. Um, I mean, it's just just in the second stops paying them tribute, doesn't he? He does. Um, which, I mean, you do have to think, what was he thinking? But then again, we know what happens. Yes. Next, and he did, he was not to know what happened next. And I think Justin the second is a very interesting figure. But yes. I think. Uh, Definitely a, a subject for another time, I think. Yes. Well, Heraclius has his few years of peace from 628 to 632 when Mah Muhammad dies and then the next caliph, Umar, uh, emerges from Arabia and starts attacking both Persia and the Roman Empire. Yes, I mean... They, I mean, there were a few raids starting to come into the empire from about 629, I think. Yes. Um, but, they, but they didn't think it was anything to worry about. Mm. I mean, that is probably nothing much more than was usual. Yeah. But I've, it's 632 that the Arabian forces actually start invading rather than just raiding yes I'd say. Um, and of course it culminates in 636 and the Yarmouk um, battle, yes. battle of Yarmouk mm. um, which Heraclius obviously by this point is quite old or very old really by the standards of the day he's also ill and has um, hydrophobia. Yes. Which, uh, so he's not in the best of states. No. Um, so he has to trust the command of the army to um, take care of it for him, essentially. Yes. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the command. Um, Theodore, someone. In, well, I mean, but they obviously they managed to bring um, the Arabs to battle, but the terrain itself is was not probably the best chosen. Mm. Um, yes. there, are, there are ravines nearby, um, and you know if you believe if you believe the accounts of the battle and the numbers which they say, which of course being ancient numbers, you do have to take with a pinch of salt. Um, then, And this period doesn't have very good sources particularly. No, but apparently the Romans vastly outnumbered the Arabs. Um, I myself am actually very skeptical of that because I don't see how Heraclius could get an army in the hundreds of thousands like the Arabs suggest he does in their sources, mm. um, especially when he's only got about 50,000 men, you know, at the start of his great campaign to take out the, well, to win the Sassanian war. Yeah. I, I'm very skeptical, even, even with the reconquest of the Eastern provinces, I don't see really how we can get this like, you know, 100,000, 200,000 strong army, which it is claimed he does in some of the sources. Mm. But, you know, nevertheless, it's a substantial battle. And I think you can tell it's a, you know, a substantial battle is that 
obviously with the loss of this battle, despite there was other skirmishes, I mean, it shouldn't be taken as this battle being the only fight. Yeah. But, you know, on lo upon losing this battle, it's the start of, you know, probably what? The end of the road. A, a great retreat back to Anatolia. Yes. Syria is essentially abandoned. You have the fall of Jerusalem in 638. You start having attacks spread into Egypt at that time as well. And in the Persian Empire, you have their capital of Ctesiphon fall in 639. So it, although Yarmouk isn't uh, it's decisive, but it's not immediate in its yes um, effect. But it is very important. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Um, I wouldn't. Yeah, it's yeah. so important. I I'm mean, not saying you are. It's just uh, it's a pivotal battle, but maybe not wholly pivotal if that makes sense yes in that it wasn't the be all and end all in the theater yeah. there was still i mean i don't i don't obviously once you lose one army it's very hard to put together another one but there was still resistance it wasn't just an immediate withdrawal yeah and uh so i think that brings us to the end of Heraclius's reign. So Heraclius is often credited as being the savior of the empire, but also the man that lived too long. And this is because as well as defeating the Persians and sorting the empire out afterwards, he did do several measures that in the long, t in the long run proved to be a hindrance to the empire. Uh, in the first case, his first wife Fabia Eudokia dies shortly after he becomes emperor, and then he takes the very unpopular decision to marry his cousin Martina, which was an incestuous marriage and would prove to be a cause of contention after his death. You also have his attempt to resolve the religious problems of the time by introducing monergism, which is that Christ had one energy, which fails to sort out the religious tensions at the time. He then retracts that and introduces the policy of monothelitism, which is that Christ has one will which also doesn't fail, uh, doesn't succeed, I mean, but it's a policy that is continued into the reign of Constance II, which also causes tensions and isn't properly solved until the reign of Constantine IV. Uh, Mark, how would you comment on these things? Um, well, I mean, I mean, we can... You know, obviously, with hindsight, we can say that his attempt to solve the monophysite um, debacle once and for all is, is admirable that he tries. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's a compromise, and the compromise wasn't going to please anyone. Mm. And those who are hardline enough to actually properly care about these issues because you know you know it's the bishops and the that you know those who split into these two camps those who are hardline enough to actually um try and negotiate with him on this they're not going to follow this um this middle ground yeah um and of course i think in the end he, it is him and Monothelitism is called is uh, pronounced heresy. Yes. Um, later on. Yeah, in the the six seventies, uh, I believe. Mm. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, his marriage obviously didn't help his reputation there at all. Uh, no. 
um, but as I say, when one thing which is I think remarkable is that even after you know the retreat back into Anatolia and the loss of um, you know, most of your army and this other set of controversies, he isn't deposed. No. Um, he isn't. Well, whether that's just sort of because there's really no one who... I think... Yeah. I think that there's two things to that. The first one is, although he has had some losses he is still very well respected he is the one that recovered the true cross he defeated the persians um he has this respect he delivered the empire from the tyrant focus um it's also to remember that the first user you first usurper focus was a tyrant and i think that that was still f fresh or maybe not or remembered in people's minds that the last time we rebelled we had someone that went around killing everyone so yes um but also there is a very interesting uh fact that since theodosius the first there were almost no real attempts to um, depose the empire, emperor. Mm. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, see, that's the thing. I think, judge, I think maybe I'm a bit guilty in that fascination there and judging it by later, by the later empire. Yeah. Um, which, of course, emperors were deposed for a lot less than yeah. losing half the empire. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. But though he wasn't deposed, there was some complications when he died. Um, in his will, he made Martina the regent of his two sons with Heraclius or uh, Heraclonos, as he is known, and Constantine the Third, which was his son by his first wife, as joint emperors. Constantine the Third, being uh, a man, uh, naturally became the senior emperor and ruled for about a hundred days before he died of tuberculosis, which he had caught before he became sole emperor. Although I believe, isn't there rumours that they uh, have at Clonus and Martina poisoned him? There are rumours, but in I believe that is just a rumour. Yes. Just like how Suetonius says that, oh yes, uh, said emperor died naturally, but his wife probably did it. <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, yes, I think I think the tuberculosis is the uh, mm. probably the more likely. Um, probably. Although. Um, the rumor does have an important aspect because the Senate, who really disliked Martina, seized upon it and uh, used it to help oust Martina. Because once Constantine III died, it was worried that Martina and then her son, who was seen as illegitimate because of he was the product of incest, would now be the sole emperors. Which means that uh, later on in 641, Valentine, the commander of the Eastern Army, um, rebels and secures Constantine the Third's sons, Heraclius and Theodosius. And the younger, the young Heraclius will become Constans the Second. Martina is deposed in a city riot, and then he, uh, she and her son are mutilated and then exiled to Rhodes, where they die, uh, probably in that same year. Yes. And then the young 
Constans II, who is about 10 years old, becomes the new emperor and now has to deal with one of the largest invasions the empire has ever experienced since the Persian although, one. <laughs> although we, we do say he did. I mean, it's really more of a regency council who... Uh... Until 644, yes, that is true. Um, also, you know, perhaps some of my previous criticisms, which you may have heard, um, of course, I think the Byzantines withdraw from Egypt during this Regency period. Mm. Um, but I think that Egypt is far more con far more contested conflict than in Syria. Yes, um, there there is dogged fighting f between the Arabs and the Romans, but. Um, the, there is a very clear account of it in the Chronicle of John of Nicu, yeah. and there's all sorts of problems going on in the Roman army, which mean that the civil, military, and ecclesiastical authorities in Egypt do the best they can, but by 641, without imperial leadership and incompetency, the Egypt is lost, and Cyrus of Alexandria, the patriarch, has to surrender it because I think he knows that. Yes, uh, it's too late. And of course, it should be noted that the grain dole ends with the mm. loss of Egypt um, in Constantinople. Um, yeah. Although obviously they, they weren't running out of grain to starvation sort of levels because um, no. Africa was still in Byzantine hands. Um, so they were still and Sicily, so they, yeah. they were still able to get it. But in terms of having the huge surplus, which enabled them to give out this doll going right back to the last years of the Republic, that doesn't. Yes, uh, I think that's probably the more symbolic uh, yeah. outcome that this long time Roman institution finally comes to an end. Do you agree? Yes, yes, I, <laughs> uh, yes, um, is, I mean, but was, I mean, of course, the question would arise then, of course, I don't think we really know the answer is, would that symbolism be lost on the uh, masses in Constantinople, or do they really just really more, I mean, obviously, they would have cared about getting free bread, of course. Mm. Um, you know, I do wonder if this symbolism is more the product of us knowing. Yeah. Nowadays. Well, that wasn't, there is no report of a riot or anything like that, but I, I think it's lost. Yes. The time. Although... Anyway, so Constance, who is a little lad, has to now defeat the Arabs. Now they're fiercest, and we we have we have a bit of a different opinion on Constance. Mm. So in the first part of his reign, until he becomes full emperor, essentially things start going badly. Um, they lose uh, Libya. Uh, Armenia is effectively uh, lost as a Roman satellite. Yeah. Uh, Anatolia is being encroached upon, Cilicia is lost, uh, Cyprus gets raided, the islands get raided. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, things are Muawiya? Muawiya, yeah. His, uh, his, yeah. He actually builds a fleet and is raided yes. by sea. Yes. Uh, Constance, to his credit, um, Valentine, his regent, rebels and he is then lynched in Constantinople when the Patriarch refuses to crown him. And then at the age of about 13 or 14, Constance becomes sole emperor and then leads an army east to secure the west of Armenia, which had just been captured by the Arabs or rather given over to the Arabs by the Armenian prince Theodore. Although it should be noticed that he is not really that successful um in these this first land campaign he does capture and 
keep hold of Armenia, but the eastern part is effectively lost. Yes, and um, he he's forced to sue for peace. Um, I think as a um, because of a huge Arab invasion starting to make its way towards Anatolia proper. Um, and he makes peace for a short amount of time. I might have that completely wrong, but uh, <laughs> is that is that the peace in the six fifties? I believe so. Yes, yes. that Mars is fifty four, isn't it? Yes, I think it's between the first invasion and the Battle of the Mars. There is a peace at some point between them. Hmm. Um. I don't think, well, I might be wrong, but I don't think there's a, tr a peace, an armistice. I, there is a peace treaty, treaty later on in 657, I believe, when the Arabs have their civil war, which is a favorable peace for Constance II. But I'm, I can't remember or not if there is a uh, piece before that. Mm, well, and so I, I did say I might have it wrong. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, yeah, so there's a rebellion in Africa, which the Arabs essentially put down for him. Um, but it's fairly bleak, and definitely Constance is losing a almost unwinnable battle. But respite does come in the form of the first uh, civil war in the Arab Caliphate, where Ali and Muir fight for the Caliphate, which gives Constance time to reorganize the empire. But before that, you're right that Constance has his biggest defeat in the Battle of the Masts. Which, you know, is, is the linchpin of my case against Constance. Um. For those that don't know, the Battle of the Masts was a massive sea battle that saw the Roman fleet defeated by the Arabian one, and... Uh, thousands of Roman sailors died, many of their ships were lost, and Constans II himself barely escaped with his life. Mm, uh, Theophanes says it's, that. Yes, it's a good, it's a good account. By switching clothes with someone. Yes, and I mean, in all, you know, <laughs> that is not the conduct um, I, I would suggest to, uh, to the listeners to read Theophanes' account of it. Um, mm. And when you read it, you know, you'll see that this is not this is not the behaviour really that I think we should expect of a Roman emperor. Mm. But uh, but you would say be of a for the good. or a young adult. Anyway mm. well after the battles, Battle of the Masts, the Arabs do return to Syria. Um, and then the land invasion that was sent against them, the Romans, uh, comes to nothing. But Anatolia is being constantly raided throughout this from the 1040s to 50s. But it is in the 1050s that once the Arabian civil war happens, the Romans are finally given a respite. Although, you know, to Constans's credit, he used, I think he campaigns in the Balkans. Um, yes, he attacks Greece to effectively check the uh, Slavs, the Slavic tribes that had effectively taken over the region and from that he gets lots of prisoners which he uses to resettle in the empire to help boost manpower 
Also in this period, it's speculated that he used the time of peace to establish what would become the theme system. Yes, I mean, it has to be nice that up until this point, they were still, moment I was organized on the um, Comet Tenses model back from the end of the third century. Yes, the system that Diocletian and Constantine the Great had instituted, which um, was far more suited for large mobile armies and in the empire's dire straits it wasn't really usable anymore no um especially as around the boards between the caliphate and the empire um mm. are in, you know it basically descended into sort of small scale raiding and yes. skirmishing rather than huge field armies taking the field against each other yeah pitch battles are generally avoided from now on which as much as possible yeah, which is consequently leads to the um, sort of reliance on cavalry, uh, well, not necessarily reliance, but the move to um, prominence of cavalry only forces mm. because of the obviously the utility of being able to move fast to run after a Arab raiding party. Yes, um, you know some some of the great victories um, later on, a few centuries later, are done by um, Byzantine forces, you know, being able to move quickly to um, stop the an Arab, raiding, Arab raiding groups returning back into the Middle East. Mm. Yeah, and also the uh, naval raids as well which is why the um, naval theme is so important that it's not just the land that's being, that's the source of conflict. It's on the sea as well. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, once again, um, Constance also does manage to um, campaign against the Lombards. Yes, he goes that. to Italy and attacks them. He basically um, makes... Unsuccessfully, so but also... Success in the emperor is now able to look west. Yes, um, and I mean he sort of, in all but name, makes Syracuse his his sort of capital almost. Yeah, you know? um, it's sort of his base for dealing with the western provinces. I yeah, mean, with the, rebellion in, with the rebellion in Carthy in uh, Africa, it was good to be nearby. Yeah, from six sixty two to his death in 668, Syracuse is Constance's capital from then on, effectively. But also, I think that it does make sense in a way that he isn't just fleeing from the front, but he is also, he's moving to the next hotspot, really, that there are Arabs all around what's left of the African province, there's the Lombards that need to be uh, considered in Italy. You've also got the Romans themselves that need to be watched because you've had two rebellions in Africa, one by Gregory and then by his successor. And you've also had trouble with the Pope over um, monothelitism because the Pope at the time, Pope Martin, was Chalcedonian and his successor Vitalian continued to be not accept monothelitism but didn't speak out against it if that makes sense. So, yes, um, although Constance does visit Rome. He uh, does. And steals all their gold I believe. <clears throat> yeah, it's a somewhat um, two-faced appearance there but he does visit Rome, which is <laughs> more than the rest of the uh, most, most Eastern emperors did. Yes. Anyway. And then Constance II is murdered. And uh, Constantine IV takes the throne. Yeah. Which we then has to deal with 
a new Arab invasion, which I think brings us to the end of our little chat, I think. Yes. So, Mark, um, to conclude, uh, do you think that Heraclius at Constans the Second's defense against the Persians and Arab invasions were successful or not? Well, the empire didn't fall, did it? Um, yeah, well, I think Constans, even though I would, you know, he against the Arabs themselves, he was quite lucky in many ways, but then luck is a huge part of war. Mm. Uh, the you know, the subsequent First Civil War of the Caliphate, I think, helped him out. Oh, yeah. I I, I think if it wasn't for that, then ooh, uh, the Roman Empire might have looked a bit smaller. Um, but, you know, and I don't think you can ignore that, you know, the Battle of the Mars did have long, long-term consequences mm. um, in that you know, the Arabs, because you need control of the sea if you're going to take Constantinople. Yeah. Um, and that's why, and it's because of the control of the sea, which is why they were able to get close on a number of occasions and ultimately led to the Great Siege of 717. Yes, under Leo III. But, no, in all, as I said, the, you know, you got to, and Heraclius, well... <laughs> Aside from a fighting withdrawal back to Anatolia, which he ha didn't have much control over, no, as, you know, in all, I, you know, I can I can say that I'm not sure. I don't have as good an opinion as Constant Second as you do, but in all fairness, Heraclius does does not do all that much really to stop. You know, he is not that successful against them. Mm. Um, the resistance in Egypt is not under his control or his directives. No, in fact, um, the the war in Egypt is almost totally devoid of any imperial direction because the emperor is dying and then there's no emperor, well, several emperors that can't really do anything. And so... then it's too late by then. But, as I say, uh, the, the continued existence of the Empire um, you know, shows that they weren't complete failures, were they? Either of them. No, no. I, I strongly agree. If, I, I would say that if it wasn't for Heraclius and Constance II, there probably wouldn't be a Roman Empire, or at least not what would continue on. No, and... You know, if you want to take a extreme version of that, maybe no no Christianity anymore. Mm. Um, so yes, they they were successful in that. Could they have done any better? I'm not sure they could have. Um, battle of the Battle of the Mars, notwithstanding. Um, mm. But you know, I would I, say. Oh, go on. No, no, please continue. I would say that um, Heraclius was against the Persians. What he, he did was very, very risky, but also um, a complete success. Yes. And I don't think there's any argument that that part of Heraclius's reign was um, a stroke of genius mm. or brilliance or other very congratulatory words but after that when he's starting to get older and uh, suffering from a myriad of illnesses then his brilliance is spent really yes and the resources were gone yes um, to put up a similar sort of resistance you which is why I find that Constance II, although did have 
has failed and was defeated often um, for a teenager to keep the empire together and also set the foundations for what the empire would look like for the next few centuries to come and also continue to have a dynasty that would go on until the end of the century. Um, he too was a very successful emperor in his own right, who I, th I, I would say perhaps had more successes in the long term, perhaps, oh, yeah. than Heraclius. Yes. Um, well, Heraclius' successes definitely weren't long-term successes. Mm. Um, I mean, his, his main legacy being uh, mono, monothelitism. Um. <laughs> yes, which uh, Constans then had to go and uh, just tell people not to talk about it. Yes. Um, so, yes, in terms of long-term influence... I would I would give it to Constans if it was a competition between the two. Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. If uh, you're finished, Mark, um, yes. I don't have anything else to say. Uh, I would say thank you, everyone, for listening and watching this video. Thank you very much, Mark. Mm, I believe... You. You have something to say about yourself in regards to uh, other your own? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I would um, say if you uh, sort of see my sort of historical interests are very, very, very broad. Um, in fact, the only sort of historical um, thing I don't particularly like is Henry the Eighth because. If you're British, you know he is done to death in this country. Um, so, but I am in the process of setting up a similarly source-based um, channel. Um, first video should be out within a few days, or even before this goes out. Um, I don't know when you're planning, um, but there's um, I'm doing one based on the. Age of the Pike, sort of. It's going to be from basically 17th century to the mid 18th century. We're going to look at the history involved in that. Um, and of course, there's loads of great stuff in there. There's the um, English Civil War, there's the wars of religion throughout uh, Europe, the glorious revolution in this country, and the gradual modernization um, of the Western world. It is a period of transformation and it's very interesting. And if you are all interested, I hope uh, you'd be, you'd like to join me in our look at that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for coming along. Thank I you for forward, having me. I look forward to seeing what you have to offer. Thank you. Well, I have been your host, Daniel Maynard. My guest has been Mark. And I hope to see you both. Both? I hope to see you all. <laughs> Try again. I hope to see you all next time. Thank you very much for listening.